Hello and welcome to today's PIR live event webinar brought to you by Partners in Research Canada and our friends at Snow Lab. My name is Stacy Joyce and I will be your host. Make sure that if you are joining us live, you find your way to the chat button in the top left corner of your screen. Change the to field so that it includes uh, attendees or everyone and, uh, and let us know what you're wondering. Don't wait till the, uh, till the end of the webinar. Feel free to send us questions throughout and we'll queue them up for the end. Also make sure to let us know where that question is coming from, either a school name or a student name or something like that so we can give you a shout out when we ask your question. So today's guest is Dr. Chris Jillings. He is a Snow Lab research scientist and he is joining us from two kilometers underground in Sudbury, Ontario. Thank you so much for joining us, Chris. I'll let you take it away. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. And uh, what I'm going to do is go over a little bit about the question, how do you measure something that you can't see and nobody has seen before? So I'm going to start with a few pictures. Uh, and then I'm going to go for a little walk around our lab so that you can kind of see what it looks like in, in reality walking around. And then if I time it right, there will be lots of time for questions at the end. So maybe I'll start by sharing my screen and showing a few pictures and explaining a little bit about why we uh, uh, like to come underground. Okay, so I trust you can see the picture, how to know the universe from a hole in the ground, or how do you measure something no one has measured before? And, and I guess the first question is, is why do we go underground? Why do we take the trouble to, to build a clean room in a lab deep underground? And the reason is, on surface right now, going through your head about 30 times a second is a cosmic ray going through your brain. These cosmic rays are electrically charged and they light up a sensitive uh, particle detector like a Christmas tree or I guess to be seasonal like a jack-o-lantern. So we want to uh, get away from all of that and nothing filters out those cosmic rays better than uh, uh, a couple of kilometers of good Sudbury rock. Um, you can hear a little bit of noise behind me in the lab, perhaps. That's normal. We've got a mixture of some of the most exquisitely delicate instruments you can possibly imagine and, a, uh, and some industrial stuff like forklifts and whatnot. So don't worry if you hear beeping or something. Okay, so I've got here a picture of a curler. I'm from Saskatchewan, so I think about curling a lot. And uh, this is Kristen Streifel delivering a rock. Now, if she's trying to throw a takeout in curling, imagine she's yellow, she's throwing at the blue rocks, the yellow rock comes at the blue rock, both scatter off, she's made her hit, and all's good. The dark matter version of this, though, is we don't see the yellow and the blue rock, we just see the blue rock. And that's our target. And we don't see the dark matter coming at it. We can't see it, and then we just see the rock in the house, as it were, recoiling away. So how do we detect dark matter this way, right? All we see is the recoil of the rock in the house. We don't know what actually was thrown at the rock, and this is what we need to figure out. So the first thing to start out with in the experiment I'm going to talk about today, DEEP 3600, I spelt DEEP correctly there. It stands for Dark Matter Experiment with Argon. Um, we use liquid argon. It's very easy to purify. And when dark matter hits the argon nucleus, the nucleus recoils just like the curling rock. And that recoiling argon creates unstable molecules which break apart and give off a flash of light. So what we did is we built a transparent and pure acrylic vessel to hold the argon. Because the, I think you all know that you are all a little bit radioactive, right? One of the most radioactive things in your house is a banana uh, after your uh, fire detector, uh, your smoke sensor. Um, there's natural radioactivity in everything, including in the mine rock uh, at low levels. It's not dangerous, it's part of nature, but it would mimic the signal of dark matter in our experiments. So one of the reasons we chose acrylic is we could make it extremely pure. And we sourced some extremely pure acrylic uh, into five, basically we got five panels of it and we shaped it into orange slices. And we did a whole bunch of machining to machine it into shape. And then we did a whole bunch of machining to machine it more into shape. 
And then we added on uh, the light guides, which take the light, the flash of light from the liquid argon out to our light sensors. And then we added more of them. And by the time we were done, we had 255 light sensors all looking in the detector. Now this thing is supposed to be an optical instrument, right? We're trying to measure that, ironically, the dark matter, which we can't see with light at all, hits the argon nucleus, the argon nucleus recoils, it does some chemistry and we get a flash of light, we then need to measure that flash of light. So it really is an instrument. If you know the opening scene of James Bond where you look down the barrel of his gun, this is looking right down the barrel of a light guide and what we see on the far side of the detector is, is, is all the other light guides. Um, so it really does look beautiful. We then put it in a stainless steel can to keep it safe. And that's in a water tank to keep the natural radioactivity from the rock away. So we've got super pure acrylic. We've got a completely pure components. We've got very clean steel. And we sit it in a whole bunch of ultra pure water to keep any natural radioactivity away as, as much as we can. It is in a very large room, which we're gonna go see. This is called the Cube Hall at Snow Lab. It's about 50 foot by 50 foot by 50 foot, plus room for the staircase and the crane and whatnot. And this is what I mean by a mixture of the industrial and the very sort of exquisitely sensitive uh, equipment. That's a, a 10 ton crane on a rail that we can move to work with our detector pieces. Um, here is, uh, one of the workers uh, getting ready on, to install cables into the detector and uh, working on top. You'll notice the lifeline health and safety when you're doing stuff like this is, is of course really important to get right. Um, once we got the light guides in, we had people wearing um, even cleaner clothes than what I'm wearing now, wearing Tyvex with uh, uh, face shields, the uh, graduate students with beards, some of them actually shaved for this part of the job, so there'd be no beard hair getting in. And now you can see the detector with the extra plastic to keep out radioactivity between the light guides. You can see some of the light sensors are in. That's a light sensor right there. There's the tube that looks into the center of the detector. This white plastic stuff is uh, plastic shielding to keep radioactivity out. The neat thing you'll notice is that the plastic shielding is held in with what looks like springs. And those, in fact, are springs. And that's super important because liquid argon is cold. It's, it's, it's about uh, 180 Celsius below zero. And the plastic shrinks. And if we, uh, but different plastics shrink at different speeds with temperature. So if, 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 you, uh, if we rigidly mounted the plastic, we'd break the detector. So everything has to be spring loaded so it has a chance to move a little bit as, as things cool. Um, the other thing too is, is here we are getting at the top of the detector through a long tube so that we can insert things into the middle. And again, this picture highlights that when we build something like this, it's not just the work of scientists, it's the work of skilled tradespeople, it's the work of engineers, it's, it's the work of IT people, uh, chemists, all manner of uh, people are, are needed to build something like this. And that's one of the things I really enjoy about my job is the different skills that people bring down from logistics to um, uh, well, to everything, skilled trades, engineering, it's, it's super important. Uh, here is one of my students hired who was crawling underneath that steel deck, making all the cable connections. That's actually a picture of me doing up cable connections as we were completing the detector. And it, things got very busy. All of these people are working away on different things here, checking that uh, the detector is leak tight and doing various assembly. Um, a whole bunch of graduate students, the senior professor in charge of the project, he's the one uh, not doing work but standing looking at the other people do work. You can see the tradespeople are in their harnesses so they can work up high. Uh, lots of stuff going on uh, that's involved in doing something like this. Um, so that's kind of what the point I wanted to make is that doing this work takes an incredible number of people in order to put together an experiment like this. 
we've taken our first set of data and we're taking our second set of data. And our first set of data was actually a fairly small data sample of just a few days long. And we analyzed it and, and looked uh, and, and published the results from that. Uh, we haven't seen dark matter yet. Uh, we wouldn't have necessarily expected to see the dark matter with just the four days of data. Dark matter doesn't interact much with the detector. So what we really want to do is take data for a long, long time to uh, uh, get a better, um, to, to, to get more chance for dark matter to interact with our detector. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to just take you on a bit of a walk through the lab. And uh, um, I'm still connected. Thumbs up. Good. And uh, where I'm going in the lab, actually, uh, we can get interference from uh, RF interference, which can affect our detector. So I'm going old school and dangling a long 100-foot uh, Ethernet cable beside me. And you'll forgive me, it's about to get loud. Now, one of the things about in the lab, so I mentioned liquid argon is uh, cold. That's our fridge. Um, we actually have three cryo coolers. They're the yellow things you see. Let's see if I can aim this right. And the big blue tank underneath is a buffer tank with a couple of tons of liquid nitrogen in it. And that's what uh, we use to keep our detector cold. Um, so what I'm going to do now is just kind of turn around the computer. So this is a view of the lab. The blue is our air duct for breathing air, our ventilation. And as I turn it down, you can see the deck where our experiment is. The black cabinets you see are a series of, uh, of uh, electronics racks. That's where we do our, our electronics and readout. And we've got all sorts of piping and cryogenics where we uh, uh, purify our liquid argon. This is what the room actually looks like. It's rather large. And uh, sometimes people don't like standing there looking down. So I'm going to go back to the desk where it's a bit quiet. When we analyze our data, one of the key issues is we need to um, understand all the conventional sources of radioactivity that could mimic the dark matter in some way. So I've spent about 11 years working on the DEEP project in one form or another. Of those 11 years, I've probably spent 10 and a half years worrying about what the conventional radioactivity would be like to mimic our signal and only a few months thinking too much about the dark matter signal itself. And that's extremely important because if you're going to claim to measure something no one's seen before, you better be right. So with that, I think I should open it up to questions. Perfect. Thank you so much. I, I must admit, I didn't know we were going to talk about curling today, but it's quite timely um, and totally understandable from the north and the and the prairies of Canada. Um, let's start with a question from uh, Ur Ursi. I hope I'm saying that right. I'm sorry if I'm not. She's wondering, uh, how do you see dark matter? Yeah, so that, that's, I, I really glossed over this quickly. So um, imagine I've got some, well, how do we see it? There is dark matter in our galaxy, and our sun is traveling through our galaxy like the Earth travels around the sun, and our sun's traveling at about 220 kilometers a second. It's actually whipping through the galaxy pretty well. So if there's dark matter near us in our galaxy, we're going to hit it at about 220 kilometers a second. And when the dark matter comes in and hits our argon nucleus, our argon nucleus bounces back like the curling rock I showed. Now, uh, what grade? I am not sure. They didn't actually tell me in this. Ah, okay. So argon is like helium and neon and radon. It actually doesn't want to do chemistry. It just wants to be a single atom. Um, okay, good. So 
an atom of argon just wants to be a single atom. It doesn't want to do chemical reactions. You can't burn argon. It's very hard to combine with other things. But as the argon is traveling fast, um, as the argon is traveling fast, that gives it a little bit of energy so that it can make an argon molecule. And that argon molecule isn't stable. It's, it's, it's an unstable molecule. And in, and in uh, about a microsecond or less, it will decay and fall and become two argon atoms. But as it does that, it gives off ultraviolet light and that ultraviolet light we can measure. I hope that answers your question. So I, I think it likely does let us know if, uh, if that leads you to a follow-up question to clarify. Our next question is coming from uh, Voya Salt Fleet DHS. They're wondering why use argon? Oh, yeah, that's a terrific question. So part of it is, uh, um, as I said, that the, the chemistry of argon is such that you, when you interact with argon, uh, you can create this unstable uh, molecule which decays and you get a flash of light out and you get a lot of light out and it's uh, a very sensitive detector of radiation. You don't, of course, have to use argon, and uh, there's some very successful experiments that use liquid xenon, which is a noble uh, like argon, and it does something quite similar. When the radiation gets in, you get this, this chemistry that makes the unstable molecule that results in a flash of light. Um, it's not the only way to do it. Um, I have... Uh, here in the lab, there's people looking for dark matter hitting silicon, and they use very, very precise silicon, um, actually CCDs like in a camera, um, and look for the dark matter to interact in silicon. You can do all sorts of things, as long as you can measure that recoiling curling rock. So you can use a semiconductor crystal. Uh, some experiments even use tiny microscopic amounts of heat. Uh, as long as you can measure that recoiling crisp uh, uh, atom, you can do it. Very interesting. Next, we have a question from Frontenac in the grade eights there, wondering how much of the universe is dark matter and how does dark matter relate to gravity? Yeah, okay, so this is a fantastic question. Um, the reason we know there's dark matter out there but we're not quite sure what it is, is that we've seen the effects of dark matter with its gravity, um, which I didn't put up one of these slides, but um, okay. Remember I mentioned that the sun is going around our galaxy at 220 kilometers a second. If you were to take what you're gonna learn in high school about how the, uh, how the, planets go around the sun and just take that knowledge and say this is how the sun goes around our galaxy, you'd say the sun is going to travel around our galaxy at about 180 kilometers a second. If it were going 220, it would fly off billions of years ago and our galaxy wouldn't be stable. We need some extra mass to give us the extra gravity to keep things together. Um, now the interesting thing is, is that works at the scale of our galaxy. Uh, dark matter was first thought about in the context of clusters of galaxies that, that, that stayed bound together, but quote unquote, shouldn't have because they were traveling so fast, so they needed the extra mass. So of the mass in the universe, dark matter makes about 80% of it. Um, if you include energy into the mix, which Einstein says you should, uh, the universe gets even weirder and it's about Oh, four or five percent the stuff that you and I are made of, uh, you know, atoms. Um, about 20 percent dark matter and about 75 percent this mysterious dark energy that no one quite understands yet, but does follow from Einstein's theory of gravity. Very interesting. I wonder if we will find answers to some of those questions. Well, we will. The dark energy stuff is, is a little bit outside of what we do at Snow Lab, but there's been some fantastic satellite measurements and new improved ones getting made, uh, looking very deep into the galaxy and seeing the expansion of the galaxy. You know, it's a funny thing how fast this field moves. It wasn't that long ago I was a graduate student, uh, 
in the mid 90s. And when I took my class on history of the early universe, the good data we had was just a, um, a small sliver of things, but then a series of satellites went up and gave us fantastic data that allows us to really accurately measure the history of the universe. Wow. Well, we have a more down to earth question now from a couple different classes, including the, the students at Frontenac and the students at NEYRAC, N-E-Y-R-A-C. Uh, they're all asking about your personal protective equipment. So the stuff you're wearing right now, is it required all the time that you're in your lab? Uh, pretty much. Um, if I'm anything but driving a desk, I also get to wear a hard hat. So uh, this is the interesting thing. We're in a mine, but at a desk, I get to take it off. At, at a mine, um, we have to wear the basic mine safety equipment when we go in. So that's fluorescent orange clothing with uh, even more reflective stripes, uh, hard hat, safety boots, the whole bit. Within the lab, uh, we wear steel toed uh, and metatarsal protection safety boots. What you mostly see me wearing now, the hairnet and the blue jumpsuit is actually clean room clothing. And that's because the most radioactive thing around our detectors is the people working on them. So when you saw the pictures of the people working on the detector wearing that white Tyvek clothing and sometimes face shields and masks to keep everything away from the components, um, that's part of that. We have to keep the detector very clean and that means keeping shedded skin and whatever else from us away from the detector. That sounds like it would be more difficult than saying it. Uh, it is. So we go underground. Um, check out the Snow Lab Science YouTube channel. There's a video describing how we get underground. But when I came underground today, I put on my mine gear on surface, which is, of course, filthy. Uh, come down in the cage, walk to the lab, hose off my boots, come into a room, take my boots off. I had a shower and the clean room clothes is waiting for me. Uh, at the end of shift, I'll reverse the process. I'll put the clean room clothes in a laundry basket. Yes, we've got a full laundry facility down here. And the uh, clean room clothes will go in there and they'll be clean to be worn tomorrow. Awesome. And that answers a question I was just about to get to. You read my mind. Um, we had a question from Brantford Collegiate about uh, how you get into the lab. So I think you've pretty much covered that one off. Um, and I just want to double check so I can send the link out. Is that video the, the A Day at Snow Lab yep. video? Yep, so, so the, 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 it's a great video. The lab's a little emptier than it is now because that video was made about five years ago, but it's more or less the same concept. Great, so I will send that link out to all of our viewers. Uh, also, we can get back to questions with one from Garth Webb Secondary, asking if dark matter is composed of anything in the periodic table. Yeah, so that's, again, a fantastic question. And, and 10 or 15 years ago, there'd have been a big argument about that. Um, because for instance, think about the planet Jupiter, right? Now, it's easy to see from our solar system, it's quite a bright dot. But if you were another star away, you'd, you'd have a really tough time seeing Jupiter. So maybe the missing mass in the universe is a whole bunch of Jupiter-like objects that, that supply that extra gravity we need. Turns out that doesn't work. And the explanation for why it doesn't work takes a bit of talking through, but it amounts to this. We see in the Big Bang echoes of, believe it or not, sound waves vibrating in the early universe when hydrogen atoms were formed. And if the universe were made out of um, just ordinary matter, those sound waves would have bounced around and got absorbed and got into more funky harmonics and would have been very different than what we in fact observe by looking at the, the, what we call the cosmic microwave background. Uh, think about it this way. Um, if the universe is a cello and you play a string, you get the main note and you get overtones and that main note comes from vibration, um, sound waves bouncing through the early universe. But the overtones is what makes a cello sound good. Uh, 
if the universe were made out of ordinary, ordinary matter, those overtones would be all wrong. Um, basically, the matter in the universe doesn't dissipate the sound waves. It doesn't cause them to scatter and, and whatnot. Uh, so this so-called cosmic microwave background, which if you're interested, you should look up on Wikipedia, tells us that it can't be material in the periodic table. But 20 years ago, it would have been a real good argument. <laughs> well, we have a few more questions to squeeze in here with our last uh, five minutes or so. Um, we've got a question now from Mr. Page's class at Assumption College, wondering if it's possible for dark matter to be light sensitive. Um, is it inactive with the sun, perhaps? Oh, I see what you're getting at. Um, okay, we don't think so. Um, the term dark matter is really a term of ignorance and it's not quite, uh, the idea is that it doesn't interact with light at all. It's not dark like a lump of coal is dark, which absorbs light. Um, it's actually completely transparent. Um, it doesn't interact with light in any way. Um, at least the kind of flavor of dark matter we're looking for. So the, it's not hiding from us in that sense. The reason it's hiding from us is it just doesn't, it interacts only very weakly with normal materials. It doesn't interact with electricity or magnetism, which re and it doesn't interact with gravity that really only leaves a weak nuclear force left. And that's the force that governs neutrinos and other things like that. And it is just an extremely small probability of interaction. It's not like the curling rock where if you hit the rock, you hit it. Dark matter can travel right through the curling rock. So this brings us to a question from Mr. Finn's class uh, saying if dark matter just passes through normal matter, what makes it interact with argon? Random chance um, and, and any normal matter. So, so dark matter most of the time passes through normal matter, but it's a, it's a probability thing. Um, what are the odds that it would get so far and interact with a piece of material? Well, very low. So how do you increase the odds that you measure it? Well, first of all, you build a larger detector so there's more material for it to hit. Um, and at the same time that you build a larger detector, you do a better job of excluding the natural radioactivity that could mimic that signal. Eventually you get to the point that, yeah, the vast majority of dark matter is gonna fly right through our detector without interacting with it. But there is some probability that some of the dark matter will interact with our detector. And uh, that probability is one of the things that we try to measure. Right. If, were we lucky enough to detect dark, dark matter in the first place, the first thing we do is try to work out what is, first of all, how heavy is it? And secondly, uh, what is the odds that it interacts with the nucleus? Right. So we have a question from Castlemore Public School in Brampton, Ontario, wondering if you can capture and contain dark matter. Yeah, so how do you put it in the bottle? Uh, you don't. Um, and the, well, it depends what you mean by capture and contain. Our galaxy does an admirable job of it. If you look at the simulations of, or the, the numerical calculations of how dark matter interacts in galaxies, and you look at telescope data from the Hubble telescope, for instance, looking at, at distant objects and seeing how the gravity is, is affected by the dark matter, uh, the dark matter around our galaxy is contained in a volume, oh, I don't know, about 10 times the radius of our galaxy, roughly. I mean, it's, 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 uh, that's an awfully big bottle. Um, I don't think and, and you'd be able to put it in a bottle on your desktop and say, here's some and have it stay there. And the reason is, is that 
the dark matter wouldn't bounce off the walls of the bottle, right? Like if I put air in a bottle and close it, the air molecules just bounce off the walls of the bottle. But dark matter can travel through stuff quite easily. So it's pretty hard to put in a bottle. And since it doesn't have any electricity or magnetism at all, I can't do things like they do with some atoms and put it in some crazy magnetic field to contain it because it won't interact with the magnetic field. So it would just go. So basically you contain it with gravity on the scale of something really, really big like our galaxy. It will be interesting to see if scientists 100 years from now will have figured out something that we didn't think was possible today. Oh, they'll do many things that we didn't think was possible today. Had you told me when I was a graduate student that we would know the age of the universe to a percent, you know, the 14.3 billion years, that we'd actually know that number to 0.3, not, not, to, not even the 14 or even the 10 right? That, that's incredible. We are learning an amazing number of things about how things work. Um, so, you know, we, we have to remain open to the possibility. We think there's very, very compelling evidence that there's dark matter in the form we can measure in our experiments down here. That's why I spend so much time doing it. We have to be open to the possibility that, say, my friends at the University of Washington looking for another kind of dark matter are the ones who are right disappointing rather like the results of last night's baseball game but you know that's how it is um we have very compelling evidence that dark matter is out there what exactly the dark matter is we don't know we're looking for uh what are called weak, weak, weakly interacting massive particles here which is has compelling rationale for it but you know, the people looking for axions or whatever, A-X-I-O-N-S, if you wanna look it up on Wikipedia, um, have arguments too. And that's sort of the great thing about science. You just push as hard as you can, building the best experiments you can, and nature will tell us who's right. Excellent. Well, I would like to finish off with a question from Assumption College again. Um, they're asking, what potential does discovering dark matter have for the future? It depends what you mean by potential. Um, people have looked up at the night sky and tried to figure it out for as long as there have been people. Uh, partly because you can use it for navigation, but also partly because it's just awesome. And I don't see an immediate, well, actually there's one huge practical benefit and that is we educate a lot of really good students who go off and do extremely cool things in fields that are quote unquote practical. Uh, so the development of students is a, a practical thing that's positive that does good things in that, in that sense. What we're really trying to do here, though, is understand at some fundamental level what the universe is made of and how it works. I do not know where that will lead us. I do not know what spinoffs naturally come out of that. I, and if I tried to spin it as we'll get all these awesome spinoffs, I'd be kind of dissembling a bit. We do this because understanding the nature of the universe is somehow innately human. It's something that we want to do. And when I say we, I mean that in the most global sense of the word we. I challenge you to name a single society on Earth that does not have professional astronomers. Um, and fundamentally, that's why we do it. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to show us around such a well-known well underground laboratory doing cutting edge science and to answer our questions about dark matter today. So thanks again, Chris, for taking the time with us. Thanks very much. Uh, upcoming PIR live event webinars include topics in ecology, astronomy, bendable electronics, and Canadian history. More information about these and other educational programs is available at pirweb.org. Thanks so much for joining us today, everyone. Have a great day.